Greetings, esteemed judges. Today we will be tackling the issue of climate change. Should the government act? How should it act? What are the economic and political consequences? These are the questions we must and will answer. Our presentation will be comprised of five sections. The science of climate change, costs of climate change, policy and programs, economic effects of proposals, and domestic and international political constraints. The greenhouse effect is a phenomenon by which solar radiation traps heat in Earth's atmosphere. Due to human influences, this natural process has caused the increase in the global average temperature, creating worldwide ecological, health, and economic issues. Climate change has been validated through extensive research, with humans currently emitting around 30 billion tons of CO2 each year, exceeding by far the historical maximum. The atmosphere is experiencing significant changes. Notably, satellites measure less heat escaping out to space at the particular wavelengths that CO2 absorbs heat, this finding being cited as direct experimental evidence for a significant increase in the Earth's greenhouse effect. In addition to rising sea levels, many detrimental phenomena have been observed. With the CO2 emissions in the United States projected to grow by about 1.5% between 2005 and 2020, and evidence of the disastrous results of climate change, the government must take action. The costs of climate change are serious. First of all, climate change is affecting the agricultural sector. Extreme temperatures as a result of global warming inhibit crop yield. Even crops that are well adapted to warmth, such as tomatoes, experience reduced yield when daytime temperatures exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Extreme weather conditions, such as floods and droughts, are also causing widespread damage to both agriculture and infrastructure. In the recent past, climate change-related phenomena have imposed serious economic costs. Rainfall patterns are also going to change. If the current rate of global warming continues until 2100, more than 1400 cities and towns will be submerged. Damage will also spread to the general economy as uncertainties in production will deter international investments. According to the Stern Review, if we remain on the BAU trajectory, a loss of global GDP will result. As well, it is estimated that welfare will decrease by an amount equivalent to a reduction in consumption per head of between 5 and 20 percent, the actual percentage most likely being in the upper part of this range. With projections of increasing costs, the United States as an international leader should act. We will keep in mind the previously stated costs when considering those imposed by our proposal. To combat climate change, we first observe the nature of the phenomenon. That is, that it is a negative externality. For the past 200 years or more, firms have not met the full cost of their production and have imposed significant costs arising from pollution on society. Our proposal takes into account asymmetric information, which hinders a necessary complete market, and the reality that the environment is exploited as a public good. Our plan is comprised of a series of actions that the American government should take. First, a carbon tax will establish a price for carbon. This carbon tax will be levied on energy producers and transportation on a per-vehicle basis. As this policy develops credibility in an estimated 10 to 20 years, firms will consider the price of carbon as a cost and thus have more incentive to invest in low-carbon, high-efficiency technology. Within this period, we hope to stabilize the concentration of atmospheric carbon within 450 to 550 parts per million. In addition, to transition from the current environmentally damaging economy to this new economy, the government must encourage less consumption of carbon-intensive goods and handle international interactions via tariffs so as to endorse this transition. We propose a carbon tax for several reasons. From an economics perspective, a tax would be more appropriate than a market mechanism which is subject to all the problems of market failure. 
According to the OECD, it is also one of the most cost-effective means to reducing carbon emissions. Most importantly, a tax produces a steady stream of revenue which can be used for beneficial purposes. The carbon tax is designed so different types of fuel will be taxed different rates dependent on their damage to the environment. For example, coal is more harmful than natural gas per ton of CO2 emitted and therefore will be taxed more heavily than natural gas. Similarly, cars will be taxed based on their efficiency levels, an extension of the existing gas guzzler tax. Specifically, we plan to raise the tax on high-cylinder engine cars. According to data from the Stern Review, energy emissions account for 68% of greenhouse gases and power 24%. In 2008, the RGGI conducted a study of 10 northeastern states in the U.S. and showed that while 2.5 cents were needed to save a kilowatt hour, it costed at least 6 cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity from conventional sources. This research, as well as studies from the International Energy Agency, show that energy efficiency is one of the most cost-effective ways to reducing CO2 emissions. As such, our proposal includes subsidizing energy efficiency programs. With carbon taxes from other countries as models, we estimate a reasonable initial tax rate to be around $25 per ton of carbon emissions. The exact number will depend on the type of fossil fuel burned. Effective monitoring of the effect of the tax will also allow the U.S. government to adjust the rate as needed. We estimate this initial tax rate to be effective as it brings the cost difference between coal and nuclear power to a negligible level, indicating that a transition to more environmentally friendly energy alternatives is feasible. Of the $25 per ton of CO2, approximately $10 or 40% will be used to offset that ton of emissions. We propose that the rest of the revenue be divided evenly amongst alternative energy subsidies, research grants, and emergency aid to climate-related natural disasters. With approximately $50 billion in revenue from the carbon tax alone, nuclear power becomes more suitable. We predict the economy in the short term will transition to natural gas, and gradually, alternative energy producers will take hold and higher efficiency technology will be developed, opening greener markets. It is also important to note that there is a high price to delay. As the social cost of carbon emissions is likely to rise, abatement efforts at the margin should also intensify. However, if technological development is effectively fostered, the average cost of abatement can be driven down. In addition, markets for low carbon energy products are likely to be worth at least $500 billion per year by 2050, thus opening many new business opportunities. To further evaluate our proposal, we note that first of all, as energy producers translate the tax into higher energy prices, consumers will experience higher living costs. This is especially concerning when we consider that low-income families tend to spend a larger percentage of their income on emission-intensive goods as found by a congressional office report. Hence, the poor would bear a heavier burden. This issue could be resolved following the example set by British Columbia, where a carbon tax has been successfully implemented by increasing the rate gradually to allow families and businesses time to reduce their emissions and by providing tax credits to low-income families. Due to the drop in demand for coal-intensive energy following the price increase, we predict workers would suffer from layoffs or wage cuts and investors would sustain losses. Similarly, carbon-emitting energy producers may lose potential investors. Such events will be especially impactful in areas where carbon-emitting energy production, such as in coal plants, is a mainstay of the local economy. However, as companies experience to reduce consumption, we believe they will have more incentive to invest in lower carbon, higher efficiency technologies. In Australia, for example, the carbon scheme prompted A.J. Bush and Sons to construct a new, more efficient biogas plant in 2013. Higher costs impact the international economy and alter trade relations. 
For example, in 2012, the U.S. exported 118 metric tons of coal as the fourth largest exporter of coal in the world. This is only about 13% of the U.S. annual output. If the U.S. moves away from coal for electricity generation, this will likely increase American coal exports. China was a top coal importer in 2012, a title it is unlikely to lose in the short-term future. Supplying this vital strategic resource can potentially increase the power of the U.S. in the relationship. However, it is also likely to lower the price of coal and make the polluting power source more available. Another important factor is whether other countries follow suit with similar policies. If countries such as China do not have a carbon tax, it will become even cheaper to produce goods there than in the U.S. On the other hand, with our proposed tariffs, we expect imports to decrease. This can lead to domestic industries gaining new opportunities against international industries, which could strengthen GDP. As well, we must bear in mind that the alternative energy producing industries and low carbon emission technology would be encouraged when the energy market is no longer overshadowed by the traditionally cheaper carbon emitting energy producers. Such industries would thus create new opportunities for workers and investors alike. As the lower industrial jobs are lost, so-called greener jobs are created that have the potential to increase the national average income and improve the standard of living. In the long run, the American government should also look into carbon market linking, which is likely to drive down the price of carbon. To conclude, we will look at three major obstacles that could arise from our proposed policy. One, domestic collection costs. Two, non-compliance from both domestic and foreign corporations. And three, domestic political opposition. First, because the carbon tax is based on self-reporting of carbon emissions by energy producers, regulatory bodies must be established by the U.S. to ensure that companies are not hiding emissions. Existing regulatory infrastructures that measure the usage of natural gas, water, and other natural resources in the U.S. can be mimicked to create an efficient regulatory system. Developing the system, however, would come at an economic cost, and according to the David Suzuki Foundation, would also take time and be susceptible to lobbying and loopholes while being written. Second, the carbon tax may cause companies to export U.S. production operations. Because the carbon tax is not universal, both domestic and foreign companies in the U.S. would accrue more production costs in the U.S. than they would in countries without a carbon tax. This additional cost could lead companies to close or reduce their U.S. operations, which would have a negative effect on the U.S. GDP. Some countries with a carbon tax have implemented compensation plans to prevent production from moving out of the country. These measures, however, have the potential of reducing the effectiveness of the carbon tax by allowing exceptions. Third, the carbon tax will likely be a subject of domestic political opposition in the U.S. based on America's political history in passing environmental policies. For example, the U.S. is one of the only developed countries that is not a signatory of the Kyoto Protocol. The political opposition would also place a cost on the U.S. in the form of heavy political spending on public service announcements. As the OECD acknowledges, large companies with lobbying power may argue to reform the carbon tax with special tax exemptions or fossil fuel subsidies, which would counter the goals of the original policy. As well, vulnerable groups in fear of higher prices may oppose the tax. Experience from countries that successfully reduced emissions and electricity subsidies according to the IEA, OPEC, OECD, and World Bank show that to demonstrate its commitment to these people, the government can employ broad communication strategies, appropriate timing of subsidy removal, and implementation of compensatory social policies. In conclusion, even with constraints in mind, we highly recommend this policy to the American government as a way to take a revenue-neutral stand on reducing carbon emissions and passing climate change legislation. Though costs exist, the benefits are worth it.